Good morning, everyone. Warm welcome to you for Alberstoke Evangelical Church's Sunday stream. We're a group of Christians who usually meet in Bay House School, but as you can see, we are connecting via um, social media and particularly our Facebook page. Warm welcome to you. We are followers of Jesus. We seek to hear what he has said through the Bible, and we'll be listening to that later. But as we start here, we're going to speak to God now and I'm going to pray. Let's speak to him. Our God and our Father, we thank you that technology has got to such a point that in spite of all that's been going on at the moment, we can connect with each other. And we would ask, Lord, though we can't meet face to face, that we would through what we listen to, through what we sing, through what we hear spoken to you in prayer, that we may encounter yourself and be encouraged and stirred up to trust you and to follow you closely. Lord we thank you that many of us who are listening in um, were once far away from you but that through your son you brought us near to yourself and into friendship with you and we ask Lord as we participate together even though distance in various places around this area we pray Father, that we will be together and be joyful in your presence and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we're going to strike, go straight into a song to praise God for the marvellous things that he has done and for his great plan for individuals and for people like ourselves. Mm -hmm.
Having sung that, um, we are now going to have our all age slots um, for catering for all ages to help us understand the Bible and the Lord Jesus a little bit better. Now, I thought I could make this a little competitive this week. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, um, I know we have uh, a quiz every week last night, but just this morning, we are going to have a very, very special quiz. So it's going to be all in <laughs> oh, and oh, and a series of questions. Uh, now, oh, I'm, okay. I'm going to ask you specifically, uh, so by name, but you can pass to the other if you want to for whatever okay. reason. And Ooh, scary. If, I'm not going to mark you strictly, but if your performance is not good enough, then I'm going to, I haven't arranged this, but I want to impose a penalty on next week's quiz. You'll start uh, five to ten points behind. Okay, so the stakes are real. Are you ready, contenders? Good. Yes, Andy, okay. we are ready. And our time starts now. Um, which Christian festival starts with the letter P? Carol. Pentecost. Oh, Pentecost. So, oh. Yep, I'll take that. Pentecost. Pentecost, the right answer. Brilliant. Colin, uh, which major Christian festival is today, Sunday the 23rd of May? Or 29th? 31st. What's the date? 31st. Whitson? Wherever that is. What are we? Whit Sunday. Yeah. So that yeah. means which major Christian festival is it today? Whit Sunday. <laughs> I don't know. What's that one? It's yeah. Pentecost. Yeah. yeah. Pentecost. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Pentecost. Brilliant. Um, which member of the Trinity um, came at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did indeed. Uh, Colin, who or what is the Holy Spirit? He. He's a who. <laughs> And he is one of the three persons of the Godhead. Yes, absolutely. Um, Carol, um, is it helpful to describe the Holy Spirit as a bit like the Force in Star Wars? Uh, no, probably not. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know about Star Wars. Yeah, is it? No. <laughs> No, because you know the force is sort of impersonal and something yeah. to use and it's it's you you've know. got to find it within. Whereas yeah. the Holy Spirit comes to us. Yeah, well the Holy Spirit is God, isn't he? He's, he's a person. Mm. Um and um he lives with us, he speaks to us. Um it's it's relational, you know, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh and of course it's but often that analogy gets used. I just thought I'd throw it in. Oh, um, okay. okay. Uh, Colin, uh, which book of the Bible would you read to find out about Pentecost? Uh, Joel. Oh, I wasn't expecting that, but that's a good answer. Yes. Can I, can I go for, for Acts? What's in Joel? <laughs> What's in Joel? It's the prophecy about the spirit being given. It's it spoken is. many years beforehand. Yes. And we see that prophecy coming true, of course in the book okay. of Acts. Yes. Acts. Carol, <laughs> um, can, you, can you give us a brief rundown of basically what happened to the disciples on the day of Pentecost? So they were in the upper room and they were uh, at that point quite downcast because Jesus had died and they didn't know quite what was happening. And, and then all of a sudden there was like a wind and what seemed like, like flames, flames and the Holy Spirit uh, came upon them. And then they went out and Peter was preaching about Jesus and they all spoke in different languages. Uh, so lots of people could understand because lots of people were there um, from different places because they were, um, they were celebrating Pentecost. Mm. Is that enough? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, Colin, um, when Peter started explaining uh, about Jesus and what was going on, uh, what reasons did he give for why this spirit was, was on them and, and, and what they were hearing and seeing? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, when he might have said this is to fulfill what was written about in the prophet Joel. Yeah, and he explained that from the Old Testament. Yeah, and then yeah. On. yeah. Yeah. Is that good enough? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'll give you that. Yeah, um, it's it's about uh, that the promised time has come now, and the age of the spirit has come, and uh, the last days we are, have arrived now, um, because of course Jesus has died and risen and has now ascended. He says, and now the ascended Lord Jesus has poured out the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, Carol, mm -hmm. oh, this is a this is an interesting question. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, why would that be bad? Oh, why would it be bad if we didn't have the Holy Spirit? Because we need the Holy Spirit to, um, to dwell in us, to guide us, to change us. Um, yeah, to work in our lives, I think. Um, yeah? Yeah. Do you want to pass that to Colin as well and see if he's yeah? going to add yeah. a bit more to that? <laughs> so it gives us power to overcome temptation and to walk the right way. It gives us under understanding into the mind of God and to what god has written and he produces fruit of his own that is a witness to god's work in us mm, yes um Colin, i'll ask you this as well um how do you get the holy spirit today you don't necessarily get him as opposed to you put your trust in the lord jesus christ and the message of uh, what he has done and who he is and as you turn to him in repentance, the Holy Spirit is given by God. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get in. It's but a gift. It's a gift, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if um, he gets you rather than you getting him, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, when you stop to think about it. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't always happen with, you know, visible fireworks and everything. Sometimes it's just as simple as you putting your trust in Jesus. And it, it feels like, you know, nothing's going on. But actually, the Bible says that's the work mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. One last question, Carol. Uh, mm -hmm. Since today is Pentecost, mm -hmm. and our talk today is going to be on perseverance from Colossians one, uh, do you think our next song is going to be a oh. Holy Spirit, living breath of God? B, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. C, O Great God of Highest Heaven. Or D. The national anthem. I I think if Colin was choosing the song, it would probably be Heart the Herald, because it's a Christmas song. <laughs> but he didn't choose it. I think it's C. What was C again? He was Oh Great God of Highest Heaven. Colin, would you like to make a guess on that? Maybe. And the first one, Spirit of the Living God, or whatever it is in the modern white version. Ah, oh, well, the answer is C. Carol is right. Ah! Oh Great God of Highest Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have that now um and the reason we're going to have that is because it has a, a wonderful not only because it talks about persevering and uh living a life dependent on god's grace and keeping on trusting in him after we've put our faith in jesus uh, but it has a wonderful uh second verse where it talks about when we're blinded by our sin had no ears to hear god's voice and then god's spirit gave us life and opened up the word to us through the gospel because when we hear the gospel um and, and the word of god in the bible which is described as the sword of the spirit that's what god uses by his spirit to open our eyes and open our ears to mm. um and so that's where we're going with that so we're going to have that song now um mm. to praise god and uh, lift our hearts to him in praise together O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchase me make me yours forevermore i was blinded by my sin had no ears to hear your voice did not know your love within had no taste for heaven's joys then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me. 
Through the gospel of your Son Gave me endless hope and peace Yes, you did That's dependent on your grace Keep my heart and guard my soul From the evils that I face You are worthy to be praised With my every thought and deed Oh great God of highest hell Glorify your name going to have our our reading uh, today we're going to have a sermon on on one particular verse of the bible so this is going to be a separate reading it's going to be a seasonal reading about pentecost okay. acts chapter 2 starting at verse 1 when the day of pentecost came they were all together in one place suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard their language in own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and some parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now, thank you for that reading. We're going to now uh, move to our talk. And uh, first of all, we need to pray, don't we, Carol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to pray as we before we come and listen to Andy. So, uh, yeah, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you have given to us. We thank you for the food that you provide for us each day, for the homes that we live in, and for the beautiful sunshine that you have given us these past few weeks. You know, Lord, the struggles that individuals face during this time of lockdown, and I pray that you may reveal yourself to us all, that we may know more and more that you are a God who cares, a God who provides 
and a God who is with us, even when others cannot be. We would thank you that you have made it possible for us to meet as a church, although it is somewhat different from what we're used to. Lord, we just thank you for the technology that you have provided and the way that we can connect with each other. We would pray for the possible running of Exploring Christianity course in the near future. We would pray that you may work in people's hearts, that they may want to know more about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. I would pray that perhaps you may help us all in our conversations to bring Jesus into these conversations, that we may even have the opportunity to invite our friends and neighbours to be part of the Exploring Christianity course. I pray for this current situation, that this may stir up people's hearts to cry out to you, to cry to you and to follow you. Only you can change hearts. Please change hearts and lives. We would also pray for those teachers and those children who will be returning to school next week. I would pray for the schools as they set up for the children's return and for the stresses that this may cause. We would pray that this will be a positive move for the children, that they may be able to continue with their education, that they may be able to interact with their friends, although in quite a different way than before, and that they may benefit from the structure of school. I pray that wise and positive choices will be made. We would too pray for businesses as they begin to open. I would pray um, as social distancing measures are put in place, to make businesses safe, to function. Help people to, again, to be wise in their decisions that they um, may, that, uh, that are made and help those small businesses to be able to stay afloat. We continue to thank you uh, for the National Health and for the, um, for the help that it provides our country, for the dedication of all those who tirelessly work uh, in our hospitals, in our care homes, um, and that are running these in difficult times. We would even be more thankful, um, we are even more thankful when we look at other countries and, and see um, the healthcare that they don't have. They don't have the things that we've got and they face a lot of difficulties. We would pray, especially for those living in developing countries, for those in Uganda and for Kenya that we mentioned in our newsletter last week. We pray that we, um, that they may be provided with the things that they need, that you may provide them the food that they need and the care that they need, and we continue to pray for them. We would also pray uh, for other countries where Christians are persecuted. We would especially bring to you Egypt and China. We thank you that a number of churches in Egypt have uh, been able to register their churches, so therefore able to function under the eye of the government. We would though pray earnestly for China, where many house churches are being shut down and told that they are illegal. We pray for those pastors who are arrested and imprisoned for following Jesus and leading churches. We pray for the Christians in these countries that you may provide for them strength and a knowledge that you are with them during these difficult and impossible times. So we pray for us all as we serve to live our lives for you. We would pray that you may help us to draw close to you, to look to you for our strength, that we may grow closer to you and have a deeper knowledge of who you are and what you have done for us. We pray for these things in your name. Amen. Amen. And now it's time for our Bible teaching brought to you by yours truly. Don't stop believing. This morning we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, just one verse that sits embedded in the passages we've been looking at recently and we're going to zoom in on the questions it raises. Our title is Don't Stop Believing and as we start I want to just set things up by talking about two mindsets that uh, many of us may fall into uh, when we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and those two mindsets are insecurity and complacency insecurity and complacency. When I say insecurity, what I'm talking about is a mindset that is anxious and is worried about our spiritual state. Maybe you're the sort of person who's painfully aware of your own shortcomings and your own failures. 
and you feel burdened by the past maybe or maybe the present and you're conscious you're not good enough for God. I've met people who need no persuading that that's the case. And uh, how this insecurity plays out when people hear the gospel is that people hear all the good new things that we've heard in Colossians so far, that Jesus is supreme. He is the image of the invisible God. All things were created uh, through him and for him. And uh, hear the good news of what he does on the cross to reconcile us to God and make us friends with him. And we hear that good news. And yet if we're insecure, we'll probably react by thinking, yeah, but not me. Surely not me. Surely that can't be true of me that I could be friends with God. Surely I couldn't be presented holy and blameless before him. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a good enough Christian. I'm not a good enough person. I know I'm not good enough for God. Will I really be saved? Probably not, judging on my track record. Maybe I've started well in the Christian life, but I've made mistakes along the way. Am I really good enough? And that can throw you into a whirlpool of insecurity. Second mindset, however, is the opposite of that, and that would be a mindset of complacency that's very laid back, that's very content and isn't bothered very much by anything. And here's the gospel and thinks, oh, Colossians says I can be presented holy and blameless before God. Brilliant. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Therefore, I now don't need to worry about anything to do with Christianity ever again because I'm saved. I can carry on with my life. I can relax. And because God saves by grace, it doesn't matter how I live. I can cruise. Don't need to bother with church. Uh, that's me done, basically. And that would be an attitude of complacency. And both of those mindsets, like many errors, they have something of the truth in them, each of those. And yet they are both very spiritually unhealthy, the Bible would say. And we're going to see that. And we're looking at a verse today in Colossians chapter one that speaks particularly to the complacent but also needs to be thought through from the standpoint of insecurity. And here is the verse. It's verse 23, if you've got a Bible ready, of Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to take a run-up, though, from verse 22. Verse 22. But now he, God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move on from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Verse 23, if, if, that little word if, acts like a hinge, doesn't it, between 22 and everything 22 says about the blessings of the gospel being without blemish, free from accusation through Jesus. And verse 23 comes in with an if and adds a condition, doesn't it? If, provided that, you continue in your faith. The gospel blessings are not true of everyone automatically. They are possessed through faith, the Bible says, and they are continued to be possessed through a continuing faith, verse 23 says. There is a need to continue in your faith and not move on from the gospel. Don't stop believing. And I've got two points to make about this. Point number two will address the issue of uh, security and insecurity. Uh, but point number one, first of all, just simply dwells on this point that the gospel requires a response and that response involves a persevering faith. Here we go. The gospel requires a response of persevering faith. And the complacency in our hearts needs to do business with that. The gospel does require us to respond in faith. We are to continue. We're not to treat it just as a fad or a phase that we go through, as if Jesus is a hobby, like when you're growing up and you uh, have a craze on a band or something like that. We're not to grow out of Jesus. We're not to get bored of him and drift off into other things when we feel like we've got the general idea. We're not to drift into church for a while and then decide, OK, I've done Christianity. I think I'm going to give my Sundays to sailing now because it's more fun. The gospel requires a response of persevering faith. Down that path, we must continue. And yet often how are we tempted to think, well, our enthusiasm comes and it goes. 
it ebbs, it flows, it peaks, it troughs. And that was the same back in Paul's day. Why do you think Paul is writing to the Colossians? Why is he writing this letter? This letter in which he makes so much of how supreme and excellent God's son is. And about how he stresses uh, the blessings of the gospel that we are presented holy and blameless in his sight, free from accusation. Why is he stressing them, uh, the, these things to these Colossians who he's never met, but he knows have come to faith? Why is he concerned that they value Christ so highly? Well, because Paul wants them to stick with Jesus and not drift off and carry on down the path. They've started the race well, but they need to keep going. Let me show you the verse that sits right at the heart of Colossians 2 verse 6. Um, this is the heartbeat of the letter and it says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. That's what it's all about. Colossians is about the excellence of the gospel, the excellence of the Lord Jesus Christ and his supremacy and his superiority, his betterness than everything else. And therefore it says, stick with him just as you've received him. Continue with him. Don't move on. He is enough. Christ is enough. Don't be tempted to give up. John Williams was regaling me not long ago with stories of his running career and about how he was in races in Portsmouth where there were quite substantial races, but there would be people who would start the race quite um, boldly along with everyone else. You know, the whistle goes or whatever and people start running. But with an embarrassingly short period of time, people would stop running and would walk and there would be a loss of steam and uh, a loss of pace, a loss of enthusiasm as if this is a, a casual 800 meters or something rather than an actual proper long distance race. That's what Paul's concerned about, that there would be drift, that there would be a loss of steam and a loss of focus and a loss of desire to persevere. Don't stop believing, he says. You need to continue established and firm in the faith, not flitting around like a spiritual butterfly after other things, but fixed on Christ. Let me ask you, is Christianity for you more of a hobby? Is it something superficial? Is Jesus a bit of a temporary craze? Or is he someone you treasure and cling to and plan to cling to for the rest of your life? So that in 10 years time, when um, COVID and Cummings and all the rest of it are ancient history, Jesus Christ will still be at the center of your life. Are you going to be someone like that or are you going to be someone who slowly drops off the radar when churches are allowed to reopen because you think well it's not really worth carrying on with this because that's what paul's talking about he's talking about a persevering faith the sort of faith that uh, receives the gospel and doesn't only receive it at the start but actually carries on a faith that doesn't move from the hope of the gospel verse 23 a faith that isn't complacent but has such confidence in Christ that it can, continues to cling to him no matter what other hopes or desires come along. And this is a nudge, obviously, to the complacent, to the drifting, to the distracted. Don't stop believing. Christ is enough and he's worth it. So stick with him and don't move on. How many people do you think come into the sphere of Christianity and maybe come to church or have church going family or come through youth ministries or have a vague connection with Christianity and mistake that for thinking they are Christians. Quite a lot, I would say. And they assume it makes you Christian, but that's not what it's about. It's about faith. The gospel is received through faith, your personal faith in Jesus. And it's an ongoing faith, a persevering faith, a commitment to trust him and continue trusting him as Lord and Savior, and therefore that sticks with him and leads to a changed life. Um, it might be you're watching this and you've never actually put your faith in Jesus yourself. And it's not real for you. Well, Paul would say, verse 23, if you cling to the hope of the gospel, if you cling to this gospel hope and don't let go, but put your faith in it. You can be holy and blameless in his sight and you can speak to God today about that. And I'd encourage you to do that. Maybe he's calling you to put your faith in him and be saved because it's through this response of persevering faith 
that we can be saved. That's point number one. Time for point two now, and remember the insecure mindset we talked about earlier. How do you think Colossians 1.23 sounds to an insecure person? Let's have a look at it again. It says we're going to be without blemish and free from accusation, verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. How does that sound to the insecure? It sounds terrifying, doesn't it? Because the insecure person starts thinking, oh no, what if I fall away? What if I lose my salvation? What if I drift and screw up? What if I put a foot wrong one too many times? Is that it for me? Am I finished? And the reality we've seen that the gospel does require a response of persevering faith can be used to say, well, therefore salvation is losable. Many churches in history have come to this conclusion. So I'm thinking about Roman Catholicism, for example, but also within Protestantism, Wesleyan churches, Methodism, uh, some Baptist circles, uh, Mennonites, others you might be able to think of. The official label for this view within Protestant churches is Arminianism. Not Arminianism. Armenia is a country. Arminius was a theologian, so it's Arminianism. He was a Dutch theologian who argued this point with the Calvinists. And he would say that maybe God saves you by his grace, or maybe he starts saving you by his grace. But there comes a point where your free will decides whether you're going to stick with it or not. And so it's ultimately down to you whether you're going to persevere or fall away. Your fate is in your hands. So um, it's done, it all comes down to your work of believing. It's a mixed economy where God's grace does his bit and then your decision does your bit and so you do your best god does the rest which is a nightmare for insecure people and our second point basically in distinction to that view is that the gospel requirement does not undermine eternal security the gospel requirement does not undermine eternal security that requirement of faith and i'm going to give you a set of reasons why that's the case from colossians and elsewhere actually so number one the gospel requirement does not undermine eternal security because the Bible says salvation is clearly by God's grace, not by our works. I'm thinking of Ephesians 2, by grace we're saved through faith. I've got Romans in the background there as well, Romans 3, uh, Romans 4 as well, and even Romans 9. It does not depend, therefore, on human desire or effort but on God's mercy. That's what the Bible says. It's actually God's work to save by his grace alone, not a grace works combo. And if you have a mixed economy, then you've changed the gospel. You've changed the gospel from God saves sinners to God enables sinners to collaborate and save themselves. And actually, if you look at the text of Colossians, that fits really well with the rest of the book, because how does Colossians talk about salvation? It talks about salvation in terms of what God does. So if you've got the Bible open, have a look at verse 12 where it talks about how the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. And verse 13, he, the Father, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son. That's God's action, isn't it? And then if we keep reading down, if you have a look at verse 20, um, it's through Jesus that God is pleased to reconcile to himself all things. That's God's action, isn't it? And he makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. And verse 22, now he, God, has reconciled you. It's God's activity. We could go on in chapter two, it talks about us being buried and raised and circumcised by God when he saves us. It's God's action, not ours. So that's point number one. Reason number two, well, un eternal security is not undermined because from the rest of the New Testament, faith is not a work. Faith is not a work. That's the point of Romans 4. If Abraham had been justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, it's when Abraham believes, not when he does something, but when he puts his faith in God to do the work, that it is credited to him as righteousness. The point is, faith isn't a work because it's believing in a promise it's believing in the promise of god it's the opposite of a work because it's actually about relying on god to do the work 
That's why Colossians 1.23 talks about not moving on from the hope in the gospel. See, no, do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. The point is the hope isn't in us and it's not in our decision to hold on. The, point, the hope is in the gospel. And we just rely on God in the gospel to save. That's what it is. And on top of that, even that empty handed reliance isn't a work because also faith is a gift of God. Ephesians 2 says faith is not some effort we make from ourselves and our brain power and our willpower. It is a God produced reaction. Philippians 2 says this. Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you to will and act to his good purpose. Our response to the gospel is God's work. God at work in us by his Holy Spirit. You continuing to believe is as much a work of God as Jesus rising from the dead to save us and dying for us. So faith is not a work. It's a gift of God. Uh, reason number three. Here's a reason why the gospel requirement doesn't undermine eternal security. We see we are eternally secure because in the text of Colossians, for instance, when ethical applications are made, when Paul goes on to say this is how you should live, he goes with a certain train of logic. He says, be who you are. He doesn't say become what you're not. He says, be who you are, not become what you're not. This is uh, Colossians 3.12, for instance. And look how he tells them to live. He says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He tells them to live a certain way because of who they are. Can you see the connection there between who they are and how they are to live? He doesn't say become what you're not. He doesn't say become God's chosen people. Secure yourselves as God's chosen people by adding these virtues. That's how it could add up in an Arminian universe where things are insecure and unstable. Christian living would be about becoming who God is trying to make us and we're supposed to collaborate in that. But no, Paul says you have been changed by the gospel. You are God's chosen people by his grace. Therefore, be who you are. Because you don't qualify yourself for eternal life by these. No, chapter one, God qualifies you for eternal life. Um, you might want to glance up to Colossians 3, 9 to 10 if you've got the Bible. This is interesting. Paul says, do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. He doesn't say, do not lie to each other. And in doing so, take off your sin and put on the new self. No, he says, you have taken off the old self. You have put on the new self. The change of the gospel taking you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light has happened in the gospel already. You are already saved by God's work. And therefore, the call to persevere is an outworking of the fact of God saving us. And there is security in that because perseverance and our response to the gospel doesn't secure our salvation. God does that. Neither pre-conversion works nor post-conversion works contribute as its grace alone. Otherwise, the fruit of the spirit wouldn't be called the fruit of the spirit. You might know in Galatians, um, at the end of uh, the, uh, the letter of the Galatians, there's a section outlining love, joy, peace as the fruit of God's spirit. And it's really important to see that our virtues are the fruit of the spirit. The spirit is not the fruit of our virtues. I'll say that again. Our virtues are the fruit of the spirit. The spirit is not the fruit of our virtues. We don't get God's Holy Spirit and his presence and his security guaranteeing our inheritance uh, in us because of our virtues that we earn our way up to him. No, our living and our virtues changed by him are the fruit born by his spirit. Otherwise, it's a works economy. So let me give you one more reason uh, why the, um, uh, the eternal security of Christians is not undermined. Um, and this is because if you look at John's gospel, and particularly John's writings as well in, in 1 John, he clearly understands salvation is unlosable. He says it's unlosable. And falling away is not really possible for those who have been saved. Look at what he says. He says, um, John 10. I give them life. Jesus talking about his sheep. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. So Jesus says his sheep are given to him by his father. The father makes a decision to give us to Jesus. 
and put us in his hands and he gives us eternal life and we shall never perish it's the father giving and the son giving which secures our salvation and jesus says no one can snatch them out of my hand nothing it can't be taken from us and we might think well okay fine no one can snatch me but maybe i can jump of my own free will but i think the point here is that if you were to jump out of god's hand that would be an action influenced by others that's what the devil tempts us to do isn't it that's him trying to snatch us by getting us to jump isn't it and that's exactly what's being ruled out here no one will snatch them through influences of the world and the devil and other things that pull us away from god those can't actually snatch jesus's sheep given by his father by god's decision not ours and so salvation is unlosable because it's god's work and we have eternal security we will be saved and we are in Jesus's hands. 1 John 2 verse 9 is fascinating on this as well. Just listen to this. 1 John 2 verse 9, talking about people who left the church, John says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed none of them belonged to us. And there you have it. When people seem to fall away, when they go out from us, when the, the bad soil rejects the word, People seem Christian, they walk away. That's not Christians losing their salvation. That is people going out from us because they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. See, the Bible's view is that our responses to the gospel, good or bad, faith or unbelief, on the surface, they look like they're what make the difference. They look like that's what decides your fate, whether you believe or you don't believe from the standpoint of um, human decision making. John says, no, under the surface, those decisions are merely the outworking of our identity, who we are. Are we Christ or are we not? Does the spirit produce that response in us or does it not? And so if you fall away, as it were, that's not a saved Christian losing their salvation, that's someone showing that they never were saved. Faith doesn't save us as a sort of work and unbelief doesn't damn in that way. No, that it's, it's all in God's hands because God is sovereign, even though we are responsible and are called to respond in faith. So those are the reasons why um, the gospel requirement does not undermine eternal security. Uh, because our responses to the gospel are in God's hands and it's God's work to save. So the big question is this, why does the Bible still tell us? Why does it tell us don't stop believing if we are eternally secure? Why does it threaten us with judgment in some cases uh, and the danger of falling away if we're safe? It's a good question. Here's the best answer I found to it. And that is that these warnings and these threats and these conditions that are given to God's people are given because they are the means God uses to lead his people to their eternal security, even as they are eternally secure. They're the means God uses to help us persevere. Uh, this is what Spurgeon says. God preserves his children from falling away, but he keeps them by use of means. And one of these is the terrors of the law, showing them what would happen if they were to fall away. There is a deep precipice. What is the best way to keep anyone from going down there? Why? To tell him that if he did, he would inevitably be dashed to pieces. So God says, my child, if you fall over this precipice, you will be dashed to pieces. What does the child do? He says to his father, keep me, hold thou me up and I shall be safe. It leads the believer to greater dependence on God, to holy fear and caution, because he knows that if he were to fall away he could not be renewed and he stands far away from the great gulf because he knows if he were to fall into it there would be no salvation you see these ifs and warnings and conditions are a means god uses to help his eternally secure people persevere that's why they're here they are here to disturb the complacent and to provoke us to keep on believing so we don't stop believing and just as God's sovereignty and human responsibility exist together mysteriously at the same time, so eternal security sits next to these warnings and cautions. 
um, the, the Council of uh, Dort, the Synod of Dort 400 years ago in the Arminian Calvinist debate, talked about this and said that the teaching about perseverance um, is something which the flesh does not understand, Satan hates, and the world ridicules, and the ignorant and the hypocrites abuse, and the spirits of errors attack. The bride of Christ, on the other hand, has always loved this teaching very tenderly and defended it steadfastly as a priceless treasure. And God, against whom no plan can avail and no strength can prevail, will ensure that the church will continue to do this. To this God alone, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be honour and glory forever. Amen. That's what they say. They say you can have assurance of faith, even though God is still calls us to persevere our faith. And he calls us to that response. And that is a good thing. And it's something we should love that we have eternal security. So don't give in to insecurity. Don't worry if you're anxious about whether you're truly saved. Trust the gospel. Do not move on from the hope and the gospel and trust God to actually save you and do the work. Have assurance and peace like a climber clinging onto their rope, knowing that they're safe and that they're held and they're protected. And if you trust him, you are saved and you will be saved. And praise God for that. And at the same time, take care to, care to persevere in your faith. And no matter how long your journey, don't stop believing. And now it's time for a few notices, I think, Colin. Yes, um, just a few things to mention, which are most of the things that we usually mention. Um, there will be antiviral this coming week and we'll be returning to Bible books. So I'll be looking at 2 Samuel on Thursday. Uh, the quiz is running as usual on Saturday. So do participate in that. Um, I don't know if we're starting off with a handicap, but we'll see. I you, think... did, you did very well. So I think OK, good. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I think we should get some plus points then if we did well. Anyway, there's bingo on Tuesday if you want to participate in that. And then we sent out an email that may not have got to all of you about Christianity Explored. Um, we intend to run that online. And if you want to do that, please get in contact with us. Or if you know people who are interested, um, it's going to be a little bit of a trial because we've not run the course online before but I think it will work really well. And if you participate or a friend participates, they'll get a really good um, look at what it means, well, who Jesus is and what it means to trust and follow him. So by, please email us, colin at aechurch.org.uk or andy at the same address. Yes, thank you. Mm. Okay. Anything to say on um, growing together? Um, we've got... Uh, possibly one more um, Bible study, depending how I split chapter four. Um, so yeah, so ladies, if you want to tap into um, our Growing Together Ladies Bible Studies, then um, you can do that either via Facebook or um, we put the link through a, a um, an email as well. So, uh, or just let me know. So yeah, so it'd be good if you want to tap into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, we hope it's been an encouraging time and all that remains to be said, as ever, is <laughs> stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus and <laughs> watch your hands. hands.